Hi all, this is part one of the lecture that was given on September 13th. Alright, I did realize halfway through giving this lecture that I did not record. So I am re-recording this for you. So I'm going to start at our group review slide. We talked about how many bonds that carbon can form and why. Right? It can form four bonds at maximum. Right? because it has these four valence electrons that each want to um, bond with something. Right? Remember, this outer shell can have up to eight um, electrons, and carbon wants all eight electrons, so it has to share some electrons with other um, atoms. Is the configuration of bonds always the same? No. Sometimes we can have single bonds. Sometimes there's double, there's triple. Um, these bonds can be configured in multiple ways, um, making carbon a very versatile atom. So carbon can form polar or nonpolar covalent bonds. Right? If a carbon molecule is nonpolar, we would call it a hydrocarbon if it only has carbon to carbon or carbon to hydrogen bonds. Right? Because it's nonpolar, it does not dissolve very well in an aqueous solution, thus we would call it hydrophobic. I do have this example of a hydrocarbon up on the right side of the screen. Now carbon can also form polar bonds, right? Typically we see this with oxygen and nitrogen, though there's other types of bonds uh, with other atoms that carbon can form. When it forms a polar bond, all right, we know that that part of the molecule, um, because it's polar, can readily dissolve in water, meaning it is hydrophilic. Right? Now sometimes on one molecule, we can have an end that's nonpolar and an end that is polar. And we can see this with this propionic acid. So over here, we see that this end is nonpolar. It's only made up of carbon to carbon and carbon to hydrogen bonds. But this other end, right, because of the presence of oxygen, which has that higher electronegativity, right, this end is polar. So we can see um, a polar side and a nonpolar side in the same molecule. Now, like I said, carbon can make a lot of different arrangements. It can be linear, it can be branching, it can be in a ring formation, and each arrangement is going to yield a molecule that has a very different function. Right? That's particularly evident in isomers. So isomers are molecules that have the same formula, but they're arranged differently. So butane and isobutane, where my arrow is pointing here, is a good example of that. They both have the formula C4H10. So four carbons, 10 hydrogens. Right? But they are arranged differently, which gives them different properties. So butane and isobutane are both fuel types. They're both a gas fuel. They both can ignite, right? but one of these might ignite at a different temperature range than the other. Right, so they do have these different properties. Carbon is also highly involved in a lot of functional groups. So if I'm talking about a functional group, I'm talking about a grouping of atoms, right? That no matter what molecule they are bonded with, that grouping of atoms will always have the same function, right? So a really great example of this is the amino functional group. And the amino functional group is NH2. And we see if it's written out in this example here, we have our nitrogen and our two hydrogens bonded to it. And then it's also bonded to this R group, right? This R group is symbolizing the rest of the molecule. Amino a group, amino functional groups are often found in amino acids. We will see this when we talk about amino acids in our next lecture. And this amino group, no matter what molecule it's bonded to, is always going to have the same property, right? It's always going to be a weakly basic amino group. It's going to be polar, right? And it's going to be part of a peptide bonds, which are bonds between amino acids, right? So this amino group can be found in many different molecules, but the group itself is always going to have the same property to it. Now there's a lot of different functional groups up there, and carbon being important to a lot of these, whether it's directly in a functional group or 
this functional group tends to bond to a carbon atom at the, in the rest of the molecule here. They have all these different properties, but again, if we're talking about a specific functional group, so maybe it's this carboxyl group here, no matter what molecule it's bonded to, it's always going to act acidic. All right? I don't expect you to know all of these functional groups. I just want you to know that carbon is important to them and that these functional groups are going to exhibit the same properties no matter what molecule they are bonded to. All right, if you do have any questions, you can always submit them anonymously up on Moodle. So as we transition into talking about these biological molecules, right? Biological molecules, they can be really large, right? But they can be built from these smaller building blocks. So building blocks of a lot of mo biological monomers are called, or molecules, excuse me, are called monomers. All right, so monomers are kind of like these building blocks. They in themselves are small molecules. You see we have a small molecule in our diagram here. When we start taking multiple monomers and putting them together, this is where we start getting polymers. So polymers are these same molecules strung together. All right, so for example, we have our monomer here, and if we line up multiple monomers and they all bind to each other, right, we're going to get a polymer. Now, polymers can get really long, and if they're super, super huge, you can call them a macromolecule, right? Or if there are different polymers that are bonded together, we can also call them a macromolecule. So how do we get these large strings of polymers? Well, we need to have a chemical reaction, right? So there is a chemical reaction that will occur between our monomers and the process of bonding these monomers together is called polymerization, right? Because we're growing our polymer. Now, how does this happen? Well, polymers are formed by dehydration reactions, which means when we have our reaction, we are removing water and um, binding the two monomers together as a result. I'm going to stop here, but then feel free to continue this lecture in part two.